Hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. I originally called this town hall meeting so that I could talk to you about the planning that's taking place as we welcome students, faculty, and staff back on our campus in the fall. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I first want to talk about another crisis in this country, one that has lasted far longer than this current virus and for which we have yet to find a cure. We watched last week as Americans grieved and protested after yet another unjust murder of an innocent black man. It breaks my heart to hear how this is impacting people in our university community, people who are sad and people who are angry and people who are tired, tired of the pandemic of racism in our country that has led to the unjust injury and deaths of so many innocent black men and women by police officers and others, tired of the systemic racism that causes black and brown people in America to fall ill and die from the COVID-19 virus at disproportionately high rates, tired of all of this happening in our country. I wish more than ever we could be together now. This is a time when we should be there for one another, about what we can do together to create change. I believe that every university has a solemn duty to be a leader in its community, to confront racism and to promote social justice and to care for each other. And I commit Salisbury University to this task. I've asked Joan Williams, our new chief diversity officer, to join us to discuss some of the ways that we're going to try to work through these important issues in this vital, in this virtual environment. Joan. Hello, President White. Thank you. I want to say that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we too have watched with everyone else and have been devastated by the images that we have witnessed over the past week of an unarmed Black man murdered in broad daylight and Americans so traumatized that they would take to the streets out of a desperate plea for justice. As you have already said, this is coupled by a global pandemic and the worst economy since the Great Depression, all of which has disproportionately impacted people of color. The path forward starts with the willingness of all, as you have said, to join together, to seek understanding and then act. And so with that, we have are planning several events to help us to begin to unpack this. We are having on this Thursday, on June the 4th at 5 p.m., a dialogue on race and its impact on people of color. This is being sponsored by the Center for Equity, Justice and Inclusion and the Office of the Provost because we understand that it is important for us to reach across campus and into the community to bring people together to talk about this. The panel is going to provide a space for healing, understanding and awareness, giving an opportunity to discuss the larger national questions of what's happening in, in America and how did we get here and where do we go from here? So we have asked some very, uh, very important faculty and our staff and community people, important in terms of their passion for this work and important in terms of their knowledge around these issues to join us on this Thursday via Zoom. In addition, as I said, this is just one opportunity out of many that we will provide for our campus and broader community to discuss these issues. We understand again that it's important that we speak, that we talk, and that we seek understanding from one another. In addition to that, we had already planned to do other programming virtually, and of course, when we get back to campus, we will be rolling out a very uh, robust program in terms of professional development for our faculty and our staff and our students as we begin to unpack these issues and other issues that impact people across our campus and community. We understand that it is our role to prepare our students to 
have the skill set to function in a diverse community and workplace. And so we invite again everyone to join us on this Thursday, June the 4th at 5 p.m. for our dialogue on race and its impact on people of color. Thank you, Joan. Um, again, uh, I want to encourage all of you to participate in this programming starting this Thursday at 5 p.m. Now, we received a lot of questions for uh, this town hall meeting, and those questions guided us in preparing this presentation. So let's get started, and I hope we get to the answer to your question. Thank you all for sending in your questions. Some of you, first of all, have asked if we are making progress in the investigation of the racist graffiti incidents that happened in Fulton Hall and Henson Hall last fall semester, and then again in February. You will recall that I announced in February that our SU Police Department had identified a suspect in the case and that the matter was being referred to the state's attorney's office for possible prosecution. In the months since then, SUPD has been working tirelessly with the FBI, with prosecutors, and with other law enforcement agencies to develop the lines of evidence in this case. That process is now drawing to a close, and while the matter is still in the hands of law enforcement, I'm confident that we'll be getting an update about this very soon. I just ask for your continued patience and understanding. We haven't forgotten. We will never forget. And I will communicate more of this uh, as soon as I am able to do so. Now, I would like to discuss what we have been doing to plan for our return to campus in the fall, because that is the thing that makes me happy. First and foremost, all of our planning revolves around what we can do to keep our campus as safe as possible. We are an organization of people, and the safety of our people comes first. So I want to describe for you four levels of operation of the university. And um, uh, so the level one is routine campus operations at what we're calling regular density. Uh, that, that's where we were last fall. Uh, normal uh, operations, the, the way that you were used to all along. Level two is routine camp or campus operations, but at reduced density. And this is our plan for returning to the fall at level two. Level three would be the campus is closed to the public, but open to faculty and staff. Um, and uh, all uh, courses would be delivered online. And level four would be campus closure, uh, online courses and telework. So we went during spring semester uh, from level one all the way down to level four. And we wanna come back in the fall at level two. We are now starting the process of gradually bringing staff and some faculty back to campus over the summer, standing up processes, to screen people daily as they come on. So we're implementing our uh, cleaning and dis disinfecting protocols. Some people will continue to work from home. I think you can, you can see I'm in my home uh, office right now. Uh, some people work, will work from home, part-time on campus. Uh, there's there's going to be a variety of different um, uh, situations for faculty and staff uh, in the fall. We know that it's impossible to guarantee a COVID-free environment, but it is our responsibility to keep our students, faculty, and staff, and their families and our community as safe as possible. And that is what we're going to do. Our COVID-19 task force is comprised of 10 planning groups focused on how to maintain SU's excellence in this current environment. And they are working to ensure a smooth transition back to campus. Now we've received a lot of questions about what, what fall instruction might look like. And I can tell you this has been really central uh, to our planning for how to get back to campus on the fall. Our focus will be on reducing the density within face-to-face -face classes, and we must always anticipate the possibility that we may need to return to remote instruction at any time. I wanna stress this. Uh, we need the cooperation of everyone on our campus to make this plan work. 
It is only by implementing strict and effective protocols for preventing the spread of COVID that this plan can work. If we do this half-heartedly, we will experience a resurgence of the disease and will be forced to fall back to level three or level four online instruction. And that's not what we want to happen. So we're going for level two and we need everyone to be all in on it. Now we're calling the plan SU Learn. Depending on the courses, many faculty will be taking, will, will be making more of their content available to students online. Your deans and chairs will be working on this over the next several weeks as we have a better handle on enrollments and how we can most effectively use our campus space and instructional time. Our facilities team has been working around the clock to get creative with classroom, lab, studio, and testing spaces all around the campus to control the spread of the virus. All classrooms will be de-densified. As much as possible, students and faculty who do not want to come in person will have the option to remain at home or in their residence hall for the lecture or class activity. We're also working closely with our partners on your clinical placements, internships, and other experiential activities. Now, I know that many of you are wondering about your housing situation, dining, athletics, everything. We have asked Dr. Dane Faust, Vice President of Student Affairs and Enrollment Management, to join us to provide some information on those matters. Dane, I turn it over to you. Dr. White, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. And, and before I get started, I, I also want to say thank you to, to Dr. White and, and Joan Williams for the for the stance that they're taking right now in regard to the um, George Floyd situation and the tragedy that's occurred. I, um, on Saturday, was at the demonstration, at the protest on Route 13, and I saw a number of our faculty, staff, and students there. And I have to say it was it was really wonderful to see their passion and their commitment and their standing up for what is right. So thank you. Um, in regard to housing, we've been working really, really hard uh, to figure out what our plan is going to be. We're going to be closely monitoring the state of Maryland, um, the, the university system of Maryland, the CDC, and the local health department's guidance and their recommendations as it relates to social distancing. Um, sanitizing, maintaining the health and safety of our residents and of our staff. Um, while we're creating a housing model that will limit the number of on-campus beds that we offer, we understand um, that by the campus limit, limiting our residential occup occupancy, we may be requesting the students move off campus and into living environments that are somewhat less closely monitored by staff um, as it relates to sanitation and social distancing. So we're working really hard right now to try to balance uh, these competing concerns in a manner where student safety is primary to what we do. Part of that will be reaching out to the off-campus housing providers to offer guidance and support for them so that they too are maintaining a safe uh, occupancy for their uh, populations as well. Some of the more specific initiatives that we're looking at right now are providing single single accommodations on a space by space uh, basis for students that request a single, um, and that will help us de-densify the the campus. Uh, we're also considering using CARES money that we have available for any student that may be financially unable to afford a single, but would be requesting a single. So we're going to be looking into the financial need for those students. We're also looking at suspending the first year and second year residency requirement for students, thus making on-campus living an optional experience for this fall. Uh, we're looking at releasing students from their housing contracts if they would request to be released from their housing contracts. Um, and we're also encouraging our students if they live within um, if they live within commuting distance to consider commuting from home uh, rather than living on campus. And, and we've had some conversations with some off-campus providers that have additional space in their facilities about possibly leasing that space to be able to offer more single uh, accommodations for students and, and if necessary, reaching out to local hotels um, to, to see if we would need to lease space from them, if that would be something we would want to do. Um, as we're looking at that, we're also looking to set aside space on campus, uh, most likely in Dogwood Village, uh, for students who may need to be isolated pending the results of a COVID test. 
um, or if they've been potentially exposed to an individual with COVID, providing space for them in a, in a different kind of location for them. Uh, we're also looking to set aside space for students who, who may test positive with COVID but are, are unable to return home. So we're, we're looking to set aside space uh, for, those, for those cohorts as well. Um, and from a policy and procedures perspective, we're looking at the policies and procedures that we currently have um, in the residence halls to be able to maintain a health, healthy and safe environment. And this could include or would include limiting access to elevators. So we limit the number of people that are on an elevator at any given time. Um, also limiting access to public areas such as laundry facilities and residence hall classrooms, lounges, again, so we can make sure that we're maintaining social distance. We probably at this point would be closing off our exercise areas, at least temporarily. Um, and then we would also be reassessing our visit visitation rules, both our overnight visitation, um, as well as episodic visits to the residence halls. Um, and then obviously we'll be, we're working with our maintenance people to take a look at how we're cleaning facilities, how we're disinfecting and how we're maintaining the appropriate sanitation that's necessary. Uh, furthermore, from a dining hall perspective, uh, we're also looking to de-densify uh, our dining areas. So setting up programs to make sure that we maintain the appropriate distance in the dining areas. Uh, also looking at utilizing food delivery systems that may include an app where we deliver food rather than students coming to pick up food. And, and again, we're looking at sanitizing and how we're, how we're maintaining safety as well. Um, one other area, Mr. President, I wanted to mention is looking at the return of athletes. We anticipate athletes returning in, in having athletics up and running for the fall semester. Uh, we're looking at potentially uh, limiting in-person attendance at athletic events, but, make, but enhancing our streaming activities as well, and making sure that we stay very uh, attuned to the NCAA and what the NCAA is expecting of us. So those are the plans right now that we have in place, particularly for residence hall. We're, we're excited to be opening, we're excited to have our students back, but we will make sure that we do it in a safe and secure kind of way. Thank you, Dane. Um, you can see that there are many, many moving parts to this plan. Uh, it's quite detailed, it's fluid, and it's flexible, but it is all being done in anticipation of resuming in-person, face-to-face instruction in the fall at level two, uh, di at reduced density. So I am really looking forward to having everybody back on campus in the fall. Now, it's true that this virus impacts us all, but we have to recognize that the added burden that it places on those who are older or may have compromised immune systems who are otherwise uh, more vulnerable to the ravages of the COVID-19 disease. The, the virus also imposes additional challenges for those of us who are at home trying to teach, work, or learn while taking care of loved ones or children or those who have fewer financial resources or simply don't have the proper access to internet and technology. We want to hear from you if you have any of these challenges and we are prepared to help. Our planning is informed by the best practices across higher education and the University System of Maryland, but is also informed by keeping you in mind. So that's why we need to hear from you. In addition to the technology support that we're providing, we're also working with our regional partners and trying to identify resources for the current lack of childcare availability. This is really important for uh, students who are parents and also faculty and staff who are parents. Mental health. Mental health is so important, particularly in these uncertain times. And we're encouraging students to reach out to the Counseling Center, which provides which continues to provide virtual services for students who are not on campus. I also authorize the search for an assistant director of the Counseling Center, even as the rest of the university is maintaining a pause on hiring. We also uh, had, we had outside auditors come in to examine our practices in the Counseling Center and our staffing, uh, and we received an affirming re audit report from the university system auditors. Students are utilizing the new referral system that allows SU to cover their copay if they visit a mental health uh, professional off campus. We will continue to monitor usage patterns and waiting lists in the counseling center and adjust staffing accordingly. 
Finally, I want to applaud the Counseling Center team as they did such a fantastic job of quickly adapting to a virtual delivery model. Once we went online, the Counseling Center implemented new outreach groups to build on a sense of belonging and help to maintain our connectedness. The Counseling Center will continue to offer some services virtually even as we return to campus in accordance with the best practices for health and safety. We're also providing mental health resources for our faculty and staff when it's needed. That information is in our return to campus guide and it's available on the SU website. We also know that there are lots of questions about what we're doing to keep the campus clean and safe. Much of that information is online, but we're, also, but we're also working on trainings and resources to help you keep safe both on campus and in your daily lives. Now, I've asked Vicki Lenz, uh, the director of our student health services, to talk to us a little bit more about uh, student health. Vicki? Thank you, Dr. White, um, for including me in this town hall meeting. So again, my name is Vicki Lentz, and I'm a nurse practitioner, and I'm also the director of the Student Health Services. I've had a long career in college health and years of experience in illnesses and diseases that affect college students. COVID-19 has led to many new challenges. At Salisbury University, we've had an amazing team response in dealing with this pandemic. Our environmental services department is busy at work ensuring that CDC appropriate cleaners and disinfectants are being used to clean our buildings. We are preparing our offices in obtaining the necessary PPE or personal protective equipment. We have the safety of the entire Salisbury community as our top priority. We are de-densifying areas on campus to limit the number of day-to-day -day interactions. And as Dr. White said, we are setting up educational trainings and information for the campus. We are committed to communicating with the campus important information and updates. To assist us when students return to campus, please make sure that they have had all the required vaccines. When this season's influenza vaccine is available, please get it. Bring a thermometer and some over-the-counter medications with you. Be prepared. If it is determined that masks must be worn, please bring enough so that you can wear a clean mask every day. The mask is worn to prevent an asymptomatic person from spreading COVID-19. And wearing a dirty mask is not useful and can lead to other problems for the wearer. Our office is preparing to be able to diagnose COVID-19 in, in the office setting. We do not have any testing materials today, but we will work diligently over the next few weeks to have the appropriate resources. We can already diagnose in our health center um, illnesses such as strep, mono, and influenza. We will be screening students that are seeking care to, into the student health center at each visit. We will continue to provide telehealth appointments for students that do not need to be seen in person. We want to be able to limit the number of students in our office at this, that are all in there at the same time. And we will do our best to limit the interactions of our patients with respiratory illnesses with those students seeking care for preventative services or well visits. If a student is diagnosed with COVID-19, they will be recommended to go home to recuperate. As um, Dr. Faust said, we will provide special high housing where they can be isolated and we will continue to provide health and food resources until they are able to make arrangements to leave campus. We will then be contacting the Wicomico County Health Department who will take the lead in contact tracing. Salisbury University assist by providing residence hall information if the student lives on campus and class schedules. Students that are identified as contacts of a positive case will need to self-quarantine for 14 days and we will have a special um, residence hall and space for that to happen. And as Dr. White said, we are already planning on a hybrid approach for classes so that students in quarantine will still be able to keep up with their coursework. Remember, we all need to do our part to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We will do our best, but we are counting on our students to do their part by washing their hands as much as possible, using hand sanitizer if soap and water are not available, wearing a mask in public, and not attending class or going to work if, you're, if you are sick. Again, thank you for letting me um, talk to you at this time.
Dr. White. Thank you, Vicki. Now, Vicki has been working with our university medical director, Dr. Michael Murphy, to ensure our entire campus has the resources that they need. So we will have PPE. If you forget your mask when you come to campus, we will have a spare one uh, for you. I think everyone right now has their uh, favorite mask, their own favorite mask. I have my maroon and gold mask. Be sure to keep it clean, um, but uh, we will take care of you when you come to campus. Um, Dr. Murphy will not be will will be available not just to students but also to faculty and staff who have questions or need uh, more information as we return to campus. Uh, these services will be available to anyone in our campus community, but we want to give particular encouragement to those who might not have health insurance or a primary care provider. We're going to try to take care of everybody. Now. Uh, before I move on to our budget situation, I just want to emphasize again that our plan is to come back to uh, campus for fall semester at what we're calling level two, which is uh, routine operations, but at reduced density. And I just want to emphasize that the academic calendar is going to be unchanged. We'll start at the usual uh, scheduled time and we will end uh, the fall semester at the usual scheduled time. Uh, and uh, the uh, commencement activities are still tentatively scheduled for December 18th through 20. So turning now to budget, I know that many of you have heard about the state's pretty grim fiscal picture, and we've heard from a number of faculty and staff wanting to know how budget cuts might affect uh, furloughs and layoffs. And first, I want you to know that we are looking in every nook and cranny for financial resources before we make any adverse decisions about personnel, before we make any decisions about furloughs or layoffs. With that said, uh, we've already had to make some difficult decisions as it relates to some contract renewals and vacancies at the university. Um, we value our people, and I believe that it's important that if we're going to make difficult decisions, they have as much time to plan and prepare as possible. The truth is that we still don't have a full budget picture yet. The state doesn't have a full picture yet. The University System of Maryland doesn't have a full picture yet, and we don't have a full picture yet. But when we do, or at least when we have a provisional picture, uh, each divisional vice president will hold smaller meetings and town halls to give you details and uh, the opportunity to ask more specific questions in your particular division of the university. You will also have the opportunity to hear more specifically how COVID-19 operations will affect your areas. I want to thank all of our faculty and staff. In uh, May, all of you were named the employee of the month. Um, because of the exemplary way in which you adapted and helped us to continue service to our students through this, the most unusual of times. I applaud you. <laughs> I do. So we are continuing to plan and communicate with you um, throughout the summer. We are putting this plan into place gradually. We are learning how to be flexible and how to adapt to different uh, kinds of circumstances as they arise. We're gonna send out some additional Q and A's this week, and please don't hesitate to send any additional questions to our Stay Informed uh, email address. Thank you, Joan Williams. Thank you, Dane Faust. Thank you, Vicki Lentz, for sharing your expertise with us this evening. And thank you all for attending. And remember to visit the website for additional information. Be healthy, everybody, and be safe. <laughs>